Hey there, my fellow gardeners. If you have been following me for some time, you all know that I post a garden guide every single month that gives you ideas on things to either start from seed or transplant. September is a huge planting month for me and other gardeners in the southern parts of the United States garden zones aid and up. I will start transplanting all of the things that I have been sowing in July and August, which I covered in their respective YouTube video garden guides to start my fall garden. Plus, there are some other important events happening like preparing for the fall monarch butterfly migration and planting flowers to help the bees during the late summer or early fall dearth periods, but more about that later in this video. If you're new here, my name is Jara and I teach people how to garden, grow food, raise backyard chickens, and keep bees. So if those topics interest you, make sure you subscribe to my channel because I post about them on a daily basis. We have a lot to cover for September. There's a lot going on, like I said, so make sure you watch this until the very end. You Usually I start my garden guides with garden tasks or like a to-do list, but this time I'm going to switch it up and start with the crops that you can start from seed or transplant right now instead. I'll go through the to-do list at the end. Let me know in the comments if you like that better. And this year, 2023, the official day of fall is September 23rd, and it's usually that very last week of September that I start to notice a coolness in the air or at least a break from all that summer heat that I've been experiencing since about June. And if you're in Florida or other rainy areas of the United States, you should start to see a decline in the rain, which means a reduction in diseases and pests. So take advantage and start planting as much as possible. All right, guys, there is a lot to cover, so let's just get into it. Let's start with all the seeds you can sow right now during the month of September. First up on the list is corn. If you have about four months left before your first average winter frost day, you have time to grow corn. I highly recommend that you focus on the cultivars that are quick maturing, like they mature in 65 to around 75 days from seed, just to make sure that you harvest everything out before your first winter frost. This right here is some Mayan white corn that I'm experimenting with, and I only had a tiny little bit of seed, so it's a small patch, but I'm really excited about growing this one. In September, it's pretty warm outside, so you can very easily just direct those seeds for corn. Keep in mind that the quick to mature varieties also tend to be a little bit shorter. So if you're used to growing the really tall cultivars, like the eight foot ones, just know that the 65 to 75 day ones they mature faster, so they typically don't get as tall as eight foot. You're gonna notice them tapping out at about six foot around there. The biggest issue that I have with growing corn, at least here in my Florida garden, are the worms. The corn earworm is probably one of the toughest worms that I've ever experienced in my garden. And what makes it so difficult is that they like to bore into the ear of corn. And once they get in there, they're shielded and protected from any kind of sprays or treatments. So you could very quickly lose your entire crop of corn if you don't treat for it as soon as you start to see any kind of worm damage. For corn in particular, I like to spray with spinosad, which is a little bit stronger than BT because again, for whatever reason, that corn earworm is a little bit stronger and tougher than the rest of the worms. And I have a couple YouTube video tutorials about growing corn and knowing when to harvest it. I will link those below in the description. And just to give you an idea, this is what the damage looks like. You start to see like lines of cuts into the leaves. That's worm damage. As soon as I start seeing that, I will spray with some spinosad and I will link below as well to the spinosad that I like to use in my garden. If you want to harvest fresh green beans just in time for Thanksgiving, start direct sowing seeds right now. Bush beans are great for smaller gardens. My favorite bush bean cultivars are Harvester and Golden Yellow Wax. If you have a trellis, grow some pole or viney beans, which are great because you don't have to bend down to harvest everything. Some of my favorites for a standard green pole bean is Kentucky Blue, or if you want something more uniquely colored, I recommend the Purple Potted Pole Bean. By the way, I have seeds or plants on my website for probably everything I'm mentioning in this video. If you struggle to grow beans or maybe you have never grown them before, go check out my really awesome green beans tutorial on YouTube, which I will link below. Beans are a very easy crop, especially for beginners, and they are ready to harvest harvest in about two and a half months from seed. If you still have a solid four months before your first frost date, you can easily direct sow seeds for southern peas, black eyed peas, or cow peas. These crops are vigorous growers and start producing around the two and a half month mark. But I say you need like four months because they start producing at around the two and a half month mark and then they continue over a period of many weeks. So you kind of want three and a half to four months of time with them so you can harvest the majority of all the beans and pods. I usually harvest a lot more volume or weight of these crops than compared to green beans. My absolute favorite is the pink eye purple hull pea as a shelling pea because it's buttery flavor and texture. Or grow the Thai soldier long bean because it is a dual purpose cow pea. The entire pod is edible if harvested young, kind of similar to yard long beans. 
or you can dry the pods to shell out the peas. Next, let's talk about squash, and I'm gonna get very specific, so listen up. At this point, I recommend you transplant to ensure you harvest everything before your first winter frost arrives. If you wanted to start them from seed, you should have started about one or two months ago. In general, things like zucchini need three to four months to start producing harvestable fruit from seed. The larger storage squash, like calabaza or banana squash, take about five to six months from seed. They have to stay on the vine to finish maturing or ripening up much longer than the smaller stuff like zucchini. But in exchange for your patience, they provide a high volume of food. I'm growing one right now called Zucca di Longa, which can get like 30 to 70 pounds each. That's a lot of food. But luckily there are some exceptions. If you plant a small or early squash cultivar, they are faster to mature than these standard sizes. You might be able to squeeze in a harvest if you direct sow seeds right now. An example of a small squash is the early white patty pan squash, which is ready to harvest at about 60 days from seed. Or try growing gray zucchini, which is ready in about 50 days. This is all assuming ideal growing conditions and fertilizing, which helps too. For those of you that barely get a winter or a frost, like my South Florida gardeners in zones 10 and up, you still have time. You can go ahead and direct sow seeds for basically all kinds of squash right now. Next, we have another pretty easy crop to grow, and that's cucumbers. In warmer climates, the Asian cultivars of cucumbers grow much better during the high heat of summer. But now that things are cooling down a little bit, I can grow market or pickling types of cucumbers. So during the fall, I take advantage and I grow lots of cucumbers best for making pickles because I like to can a lot of pickles. Direct sow about two to three seeds per mound, or I make a trench in a straight row right under my trellis, sprinkle in some seeds pretty densely and grow a bunch of cucumbers. Have BT spray handy in case you get worm damage, like what you see here, or spray with one cup of hydrogen peroxide per gallon of water if you get powdery mildew or some of the other leaf diseases. My personal favorites for pickling are Boston Pickling and Wisconsin 58. Check out my YouTube video tutorial on how to grow cucumbers from seed all the way to harvest, which I will link below in the description for more tips. The next category of crops to start from seed includes smaller greens like lettuce, bok choy, Swiss chard, mustard greens, and tatsoi. If it's over 85 degrees outside, it is way too hot to sow these outdoors because they get stunted in growth if exposed to high heat, just like things in the brassicas family. I recommend to start them in 72 cell seed trays indoors only. <laughs> They will be ready to transplant into the garden in about four weeks, landing you in October when the temperatures are significantly cooler. Or just wait until October to direct sow seeds. And probably not surprising at this point, but I have a YouTube video tutorial on how to grow lettuces and Asian greens from seed to harvest, which I will link below. If you want to plant some greens right now, then sow seeds for two of my most favorite heat-tolerant greens, Molokia and New Zealand spinach. They won't get stunted in growth due to the heat like the lettuces and the brassicas. I think New Zealand spinach is a pretty close substitute for spinach or lettuce. Molokia is great to add to salads or soups when you harvest the tender baby leaves. It has a lettuce-like flavor, but just a tad more on the nuttier side. Here is a Malakia plant that decided to reseed, which I am totally okay with that. Both grow bushy plants that will provide leafy greens over the course of several months without having to replant or succession sow over and over again like with lettuce. This Malakia right here is very heat tolerant and it produces lots and lots of greens. I like to prune the tips off, which not only provides the more tender, like new green growth, but it also promotes the plant to grow more side shoots or branches, therefore getting more bushier and producing more leaves. It's time to direct sow seeds for lots of flowers or start them in 72 cell seed trays, which is what I'm doing right now because a lot of my garden is actually solarizing, so I can't direct sow seeds. The monarch butterfly migration occurs during the fall. Some of us in Florida are already seeing their caterpillars. The height of their migration starts in around October, and usually I still see them in my garden through February and March. So please sow seeds or transplant loads of nectar-rich flowers to support the adult butterflies, and milkweed, which is a hose plant, the only edible food source for the monarch butterfly caterpillars. I recommend quick to flower from seed varieties of flowers like sunflowers, zinnias, and cosmos. Butterflies love large flat flowers because it's easier for them to land on them. The number one butterfly attracting flower in my garden is Tithonia or Mexican sunflower. All sorts of butterflies are on those flowers all day long. You also need to plant a lot of milkweed for their caterpillars. There is much debate on the topic of milkweed, so let me explain and you can formulate your own opinion. It is recommended that you plant milkweed that is native to your area. 
There are lots of different kinds of milkweed cultivars and some are specific to some areas over others. The reason why native milkweed is stressed is because, for example, here in Florida, we commonly find tropical milkweed in big box stores and nurseries. This one is not native to Florida. The problem is it doesn't die back from the cold during our winter here in Florida. So the monarch butterflies migrate down here. They stop to eat tropical milkweed and end up staying here in Florida instead of continuing on with their migration to Mexico because, well, there is a food source here. Our native milkweeds die back during the winter and start growing back in spring. So that encourages them to leave and continue on to Mexico. As much as this is true about tropical milkweed, since the monarch butterfly was added to the endangered species list last year, experts are now saying plant whatever milkweed you can find. Some people have a hard time finding other milkweed plants besides the tropical one. Also, I find the seeds for the tropical one is easier to germinate than the rest. Milkweed seeds generally need a cold period, also called cold stratification, to mimic winter and make the seeds break winter dormancy to sprout. To cold stratify, I put the seeds in my fridge for about six weeks before I sow them. But this is not such a requirement with the tropical milkweed and it's just an easier plant to germinate and grow. That's why, just to be honest, I planted in my own garden along with as many native milkweed plants that I can find. To each their own, I don't mean to offend, cause angry debates, or project my personal opinion on everyone's gardens, because that is totally up to you. Do whatever is best for your unique situation. Do some research to find which milkweed cultivars are native in your state, or visit local nurseries that carry native plants. I will list a bunch of native nurseries around Central Florida in the description to help you find some. I'm sure there are a bunch more that I missed. We have a lot of excellent local nurseries here in Florida, so I don't mean to forget anyone. I love supporting my local nurseries. If I forgot one, please comment below. Or if you're in another state and know of a good nursery that sells native milkweed, then please comment below to help out other viewers. One last thing about milkweed. Aphids and other insects love them and they love to suck the juices out of them. So don't be surprised if your milkweed plants are covered in aphids or like these little red and black milkweed bugs. Mine are always covered and they look gross. <laughs> Plant these things away from your veggie crops and whatever you do, do not spray any treatments on the milkweed because you will kill the monarch butterfly caterpillars and their eggs. Okay, almost done. One more thing about flowers right now. As you can see, this is a very important month for flowers. The end of summer and early fall can be a dearth period for bees. Depending on where you're located, there might not be a lot of blooming flowers available for them in the wild to forage. As a beekeeper myself, I try to plant flowers just to help them out during this time of the year. Here's some top choices of flowers that I plant just for the bees. I also have a bee garden seed collection on my website that takes the guesswork out of this and includes some of these favorite bee flowers. We have some blue salvia, which I have growing right here. Borage, sunflowers, agastache, bergamot, tithonia, African blue basil, buckwheat, and basically any kind of culinary basil varieties. If you have some flowers that you notice the bees really go crazy for more so when compared to other flowers in your garden, please comment below. All right, on to the next crop, which is all traditional herbs. And I say traditional because these are herbs that come from Europe, typically. So they like mild or temperate temperatures and drier soils. Think Mediterranean conditions. They don't grow very well in the high heat of summer, therefore I start loads of them in the 72 cell seed trays in September to transplant outside once they are ready. They grow fantastic during my fall, winter, and spring. A lot of these herbs are actually perennial if you can get them to survive. In Florida, that's a challenge because they don't like the high heat or all the rain during our summertime. So you might notice a lot of them dying off when summer arrives. Those of you in California or Texas where it's dry during your summer don't have that kind of an issue, but it's still very hot. I have got a lot of my herbs to survive summer by planting them in grow bags or containers that I can move to a spot that gets afternoon shade during the summer and containers, especially grow bags, drain and dry out quickly. Herbs are easily susceptible to root rot, so this helps a lot. I will link below in the description to these same grow bags that I like to use in my garden. All right, so that was all of the things that I recommend that you start from seed in September. Let's move on to the things that you can transplant. A lot of people are asking me if it's too late to start seeds for tomatoes. Yes, it's too late to just get started with sowing seeds. But you can transplant, which is what I'm doing because I started seeds back in July and these are ready to go into the garden. The next time I will start sowing seeds is December 1st to transplant in like mid or late January, just to give you an idea. The rain does start to decline in September, unless we get a hurricane. 
but it's still a pretty rainy month in Florida. So just monitor your tomato plants for leaf diseases. If you get some, spray with one cup of hydrogen peroxide per gallon of water, especially after a lot of rain to control the spread of leaf diseases. If you get any bugs chewing up your tomato plants like worms, then I recommend you spray with BT, which stands for Bacillus thuringiensis spray. And I will link that below in the description. I have a whole playlist all about growing tomatoes. So I will link that below because it will give you lots of ideas on pruning, planting, and trellising tomatoes. I'm also getting a lot of questions about the brassicas family, things like broccoli, cauliflower, and big heading cabbages. If you're in the south with warm winters, you need to start seeds for these indoors during the month of August with intent to transplant in October. Some of you zone eight people might be able to transplant at the end of September if your average maximum high temperatures are 85 degrees Fahrenheit or below, because anything above 85 will stunt their growth. So if you have not started seeds yet, you kind of missed your window. Consider buying transplants for these instead and plant into the garden in early October. I am doing a live fall garden themed class on YouTube. The last session was all about how to grow brassicas, especially in areas with warm winters. So I will link that below if you want very minute details, like how to figure out the correct time of year to plant these things, because it's hard. If they are exposed to high heat, they bolt instead of producing a nice dense crown of broccoli or cauliflower. With that said, you can sow seeds for these smaller types of brassicas like tatsoi, bok choy, or napa cabbage, or seeds for brassicas that are grown to eat their leaves as in non-heading types like kale or mustards right now, but indoors only if your outside temperatures are above 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Plan to transplant all of these things out in October once they are big enough. Next up, we have heat loving tropical greens, which I will just list right here that are not started from seed. They're normally propagated by cuttings. Now, I really love these greens because not only do they thrive in my Florida garden, but they provide greens for me basically year round. I would say with all of these, they're better harvested when they are young, tender baby greens instead of big mature leaves. Just the flavor and texture is a lot better. My favorite thing to do with some of these greens, especially if they are like low sprawling types like uh, longevity spinach, which I have right here, or the Okinawan spinach is to actually grow them underneath my fruit trees. Right here, I have a Meyer lemon tree. I have two um, little mango trees right here because they sprawl in and fill up this area and prevent any weeds from growing through. It produces a lot of biomass that I can use basically as a mulch. So a couple times a year, I'll just yank out a whole bunch of these vines right here and just like mat them down. And they do a really great job of decomposing, adding nutrients back into the soil around my fruit trees, but also blocking out those weeds. If you're in garden zones nine and up, these things pretty much will survive your winter. I don't cover anything in my garden. Yes, they will slow down in growth because they don't like the cold, but as soon as that heat comes back, they pick right up and they start growing and sprawling out again. And I always recommend if you're growing something because you wanna eat the leaves, not that it produces like a fruit or some kind of vegetable, then if you live in a high heat climate, like the southern parts of the United States, zones in it up, it's best to plant those types of greens and spots that get a lot of bright morning sun, but afternoon shade. So they do really well underneath other trees or fruit trees. Next up, we have some of my favorite tropical, like root type of crops to grow, and that's things in the ginger family. So right here I have culinary ginger. I've got turmeric, this is actually blue turmeric. And then growing right behind this blue trellis is shampoo ginger, which I have a cone right here. My shampoo ginger like plants are on the other side of this fence, but they spread through rhizomes. Same thing with the ginger, turmeric, galangal, all those types of things. They spread underground through rhizomes. So that patch of shampoo ginger on the other side of the fence is now spreading and coming up under on this side. So I'm gonna be pulling all of those out because it's gonna get out of control. That's why I recommend if you're in warmer climate, especially zones nine and up, to plant those kind of crops in grow bags. All of these right here are in grow bags to prevent the spread of those rhizomes and kind of control the situation. And depending on the time of year, I sell rhizomes or sometimes even sprouted plants of the shampoo ginger. And these cones start out green and then the whole thing will eventually turn red. But if you squeeze it, this liquid comes out and this smells so good. It's used as an all natural like soap or shampoo for hair. It's put in a lot of bath and body products. You can rub it on your skin. I mean, it just smells really good. It's like a delicate floral 
ginger type of scent. If you're located in an area that doesn't get snow or your ground doesn't freeze during the winter, you can grow all of these kinds of crops outdoors. The upper foliage might die back because of the cold, but if the rhizome is still alive underground, as in it didn't freeze, then it will just grow and start sprouting again in spring. If you live in a colder climate, you will have to either dig up the rhizomes before your first average winter frost comes and then bring it inside because again, these plants survive through their rhizome network. So you don't want that part of it to die. Or just grow it in a pot and bring it indoors during the winter time. Just know that these things can get really tall. This blue turmeric here is already hitting around four feet and the shampoo ginger gets like six feet sometimes. My privacy fence right here is six feet and I can see the leaves popping up over the top of the fence. So they are over six feet. But no worries, if the plants are just really, really tall and bulky for you to bring indoors, you can trim off all those leaves. I mean, here in my Florida garden during the winter, they lose all of their leaves anyways, and they kind of go into a dormancy. Again, you just want to make sure that that rhizome is protected and it stays warm, it doesn't freeze and die. If you're in garden zones nine and up, you still have time to plant tons of different tropical fruit crops and I'll just list a bunch of ideas right here. Plant them right now in September so they get a little bit of time to get established before your first winter frost arrives. For many of us, fall is a dry season so just make sure that you closely monitor newly planted you know, plants, fruit trees, whatever to make sure they don't dry out because they're new, they have smaller root systems, and they dry out a lot faster than a more established plant. I just uploaded two new videos about how to grow Barbados cherry and muscadine grapes, which are some of my favorites and most easiest root crops to grow as a home backyard gardener. So if you wanna learn more about those two crops, I will link them below in the description. And the last idea I have for you guys for the month of September is actually ground cherries, also goes by a lot of other names like goldenberry and inkenberry. I love to grow ground cherries because they're actually a perennial edible crop here in my Florida garden, or at least in areas where it doesn't get cold enough to kill the plants. They are closely related to tomatoes, and the berries are like a deep golden orange kind of color when they're fully ripe. In my opinion, they have a flavor that's like a mix of strawberry, banana, and like tangerines. Personally, I love to eat them, but I know a lot of people really don't like the flavor. Before you try to grow this, I recommend that you try eating them if you can find some. Normally, I will find a little container of them in the berry section of either Walmart or Aldi's, depending on the time of year. But that's a great opportunity for you to try it out before you decide to grow some. They're very easy to start from seed. The number one challenge, though, is that they need light to germinate. So sprinkle the seeds on the surface of your container and like press them down into the soil so they make contact, but do not cover it with any soil. And then place your container under a direct source of light. If the weather is nice outside and you have a lot of direct sun, then it's okay to put this out there. Just make sure you keep an eye on this and it doesn't dry out. Or if you're sowing them indoors, you need to have a nice, strong light. Usually window lighting is not going to be enough. So put this under some grow lights, or in my case, I like to use shop lights. Just make sure they're 5,000 Kelvins or above, which is the daylight setting. Now let's move on to some important garden tasks and reminders for the month of September. If you need more garden help, I am doing a free live fall garden series right here on YouTube. Basically, I'll walk you through the whole process of fall garden planning, planting, and checking up on you guys periodically to see how you're doing. So make sure you're subscribed to my channel and turn on notifications. That way you get alerted of when I go live. Also, join my email newsletter. There's a link in the description below so I can send you the schedule with upcoming dates and times for my live classes. If you are sowing seeds in September, take a look outside. If you're in the southern parts of the United States, garden zones eight and up, the environment outside is probably very hostile for baby seedlings. There's lots of rain, diseases, and pests, so I recommend to sow seeds indoors as much as possible. If you would like to see my whole seed sowing setup along with tips and tricks to be successful growing from seed, check out my how to sow seeds guide, which I will link below. September is also a great time to add soil amendments if needed before you set up your fall garden. If you're not sure what kind of amendments your soil needs, I recommend you contact your local county extension office. They usually do soil testing at a very inexpensive price. Or you can get a soil testing kit from Amazon, which I will link below to the one that I've used. The kit was really nice because it gives you results along with directions on how much of each nutrient needs to be added. If you have been thinking about installing drip irrigation, then now is a great time to do it before you start planting your fall garden. Over the next few days, I will be removing some solarization plastic that I have going on in my garden. 
to install a drip irrigation system. And I plan to do a whole YouTube video tutorial showing you how I set up that drip irrigation system very soon, so stay tuned. My last to-do item has to do with garden planning. I create a general map of my garden on some graphing paper before I start planting everything. This helps me visualize where I'm going to put all of my plants and make sure my garden is full. I also pencil in opportunities for vertical garden structures like trellis systems or cattle panel trellises because I try to vertical garden as much as possible. This will help pick the plants up from the floor, making it harder for pests to get on them. It also improves air circulation, helping to dry the surfaces of the leaves, which will slow down the spread of leaf diseases. Well, I hope you really like this list I put together for the month of September. If I missed any cool seeds or plant ideas, feel free to drop a comment below or let me know what you're most excited to grow this fall. If you enjoyed this video, a big thumbs up would mean a lot to me and it helps my channel out more than you know. And hey, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you know right away when I post new videos. And you can find a copy of this guide in the monthly gardening guide section on my website so that you can copy, save, or share it. Or if you prefer, you can sign up for my email newsletter and I'll send it to you automatically at the beginning of each month. If you follow these tips, I'm really hoping your garden does amazingly well this fall and you get a huge harvest within the next upcoming months. Thanks for watching and happy gardening.